Mr. Scarville. Okay, and we're so happy to see so many new faces here tonight. And we're happy to see the ones that have been here before, of course. Um, the Western Historical is really looking to uh, expand its membership, invite you all to come to future programs. We've got some exciting things planned for the fall. So we will be passing around a sheet where you can put your email, so that way we'll personally send you an invitation of every program that's coming on the schedule. I'd like to introduce Laura Provost to talk a little bit about that. Just leave it, right? Well, I have a newsletter and the news forms, but uh, Marilyn gave you the pitch. But I was just thinking a lot of you haven't been here. And it is an 1845 schoolhouse, Greek revival architecture, and uh, we moved it from Milk Street uh, um, 30 years ago yeah. and um, raised the money to get it restored. And luckily, we found the wallpaper, a sample of the wallpaper behind a vent there. When we moved it, the, the vent jumbled, and lo and behold, there was the wallpaper. And so we had Waterhouse Wallpaper Company reproduce the wallpaper for us, so it looks like it did in 1845. And, um, and then we have a school program, and we bring up um, antique desks for and set them up here in the classroom for um, all the Westwood fourth graders. So it all they all come and spend a day here. And dressed in costume and um, bring their lunches and no Twinkies because uh, it has to be the proper food for 1845. <laughs> so I just thought I'd give you a little bit of the uh, history of the building. And we'll move on, and Marielle and Washenko is going to introduce our, our illustrious speaker. Yes. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for your attendance and for coming tonight. Um, it's an exciting, it's exciting for Westwood to be able to have Doug Most um, from the Boston World and who wrote the wonderful book, The Incredible Race. Uh, it's exciting to have Doug here tonight, and we're really happy to be your presence as well. Um, the first, actually, acknowledgement that I would like to say is how we even found Doug, and how, how, what was it that we made this connection. Um, there's this wonderful bookstore that you might know, the New England Mobile Book Fair. <laughs> And so the New England Mobile Book Fair, we were, you've all probably been there in the past, it's this wonderful little bookstore, and we get lost, lost in that bookstore for quite some time. Well, somebody came along named Tom Lyons, and he saved the bookstore so that it wasn't going to be um, nothing and be demolished. So he put, and he did this about seven years ago, he put a lot of time and energy into it. And of course, his own good fortune. And he realized that eventually the huge amount of inventory that was in that bookstore was going to have to be consolidated. So his bookstore has now moved. And as they're putting up a new shopping center around Highland Avenue, Needham and Newton, he is in the section of shopping with TJ Maxx. So I asked Tom a couple of months ago if there was a local author um, that he might recommend on the topic of history, he recommended Doug Most. Doug lives in Needham. He agreed to attend tonight. We, we planned it out. And then we began to advertise this exciting book and this exciting story. I have read every page of it. Um, also, the book was made into a PBS series last year under the American Experience, so you can see that, that part of that we'll see tonight with Doug. The book itself um, is a great book club book. Um, it's great for you to read. Every page is exciting. Every piece of information that Doug researched, he spent five years researching, 
and a couple of years writing a book. In the meantime, he still works. He's, he's working full time for the Boston Globe. So it was, he was the right person to write the story. See, it's a good Boston see. story. Um, I'll turn this over to Doug yeah. in just a moment. When he, he's got right. a screen up yeah. I'll, I'll come whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay. Um, so every page is exciting. Every biography of every person is involved at this time in the mid and late 19th century to figure out what the cities needed to do to take care of congestion on top of the streets. If you can imagine, there are pictures. Tremont Street between the corner of Arlington and Park had three trolley tracks with hundreds of cars coming through very slowly because they were totally congested. And then there were horse and carriages carrying people as well. And then the, popu the Boston population was trying to cross the street. And uh, the other cities besides Boston, New York, Paris, London, were also facing the same story of what are we going to do. And Doug will tell us tonight how this all came about and how the underground story came about. So it's my my really deep pleasure of honoring Doug most and giving us his time and coming here and sharing the story of his book. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. It's great to see a nice crowd and a beautiful <laughs> spring night. We've been owed a lot of these spring nights considering the winter we just went through. Um, so, as you may have noticed, we've had a few technical difficulties trying to show something here. If it comes up, I don't know, that we're so close after all the efforts we made. And there's just going to be like a two minute thing I was going to show you. And maybe perils of Wi Fi might ultimately do us. But uh, if suddenly so something pops up. You get video without Bob. What's it? Right. If suddenly something pops up on the screen behind me, let me know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I thought what I would do tonight is I'll give you a little. Um, very brief background on sort of how this book came to be. The first question I don't think it asked is why did you write this book? Um, and there's no magic reason, but I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll talk a little bit about the book, and I'm going to tell you the story of two characters from the book. Um, as was explained in the introduction, uh, the book the book initially came out in a hardcover version. Uh, this sort of shows you a little bit how the publishing industry works. Uh, it came out like this in 2014, then came out in paperback, which is what I have with me this evening, in 2015. And then a year later, I was contacted by PBS and WGBH, and they said they wanted to option the book and turn it into a documentary. And that documentary took about a year or so to pull together, and that came out in February of 2017. So that sort of shows you a little bit of the life of sort of how this thing works. Um, and uh, here we are, a year later, I'm still getting phone calls occasionally to come out and talk about the book, uh, which I like to do. It's been fun for me. Um, so I'm always happy to come out. Uh, the book, uh, as far as why I wrote this book, there really is no magic reason. I was, for a brief period of time, when I was a newspaper reporter in New Jersey, I was a transportation reporter. Um, I covered New Jersey Transit and Amtrak, and I also covered aviation and the aviation industry, um, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, sort of a, a crazy time there when Chris Christie was actually rising to power, and there was a lot of things happening in New Jersey. Um, and I, always, I was sort of always curious and interested in the aviation industry and the transportation industry got me excited. But I think this book was born because when I moved to Boston, uh, right around 2000-2001, uh, um, I was uh, a senior editor of Boston Magazine at the time. And I started uh, getting into sort of long-form journalism and storytelling and that sort of thing. And, um, and I would say it was about uh, around the time of 2010 when I was really hankering to write a book. I'd written a book years earlier when I was in New Jersey about a true crime, a horrible crime that happened in New Jersey. I was looking for another story to tell, um, and I sort of stumbled onto the fact, a little trivia, piece of trivia that you can learn if you live in Boston long enough, which is that Boston has the oldest subway in America. And when I learned that, I thought, well, that's interesting. Like, has anyone ever written that story before? And, I sort of played around on Amazon and other places and looked around and I didn't really see sort of an authoritative, really definitive book about the Boston subway. I found things that were out there. There's a, uh, a guy named Bradley Clark who wrote like a 65-page sort of uh, expanded magazine, if you want to call it that, 
um, that was very good and detailed on portions of the subway, um, but it was not really a book. Um, and so as I started researching it a little bit more, I thought there is a story here. There's something in the characters and the people and the history and all that. And then in the course of my research, I discovered that New York City, at the same time that Boston was going through its questions in the late 1800s of whether to build a subway and how to build a subway um, and the challenges and hurdles and all of that, that New York City was going through a lot of the exact same question at the exact same time. And that sort of fascinated me, that you know, here we have Boston and New York, we know they have long history together beyond the baseball field and the football field. Um, and I thought that if there was a way to sort of tell the story of Boston and New York in some ways, that that could be a, a sort of a really interesting story. When I talked to my book agent, um, she was always intrigued by the Boston subway story, but then when I introduced the idea of the New York subway story, she was really intrigued, uh, because from a book selling perspective, if you can sell books in New York City, that's a good thing. It's a big city with a lot of people who read, so there's more, uh, more of a market for a book if you can bring in more than one city, just Boston. So off I went. Um, I spent, uh, the way the publishing industry works, is I spent about 14 months writing a book proposal. So that's basically something you do on spec. Uh, it was a long project, uh, a lot of work went into the proposal. Uh, the proposal ended up being about 90 pages, a really big proposal. Um, and you just hope that when you give your proposal over to your agent, their job is then to bring it out to the publishing world and find a, a willing buyer. And in this case we did, we found a publisher, St. Martin's, that was willing to pay for the book and was excited about it, saw a lot of potential in it. Um, and so after that 14 month period, we signed a contract and off I went. They said, can you finish the book in one year? I said, no, I cannot. Uh, they said, I'm working full time. Uh, I have a wife and two kids and, and I gotta feed them. And uh, so I cannot write the book in one year. I said, I'll write it in two years. And so I had about a two year period of time to write the book and research it. And, uh, and the book came out, like I said, February of 2014. That was the hard time. So that's the process of how I got to where we are today. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk a little about the characters in the book. I'll leave a little time at the end to talk uh, to answer your questions. Uh, it appears we will have no video. But that's okay. Uh, so that's okay. Um, so let me tell you a story about two men. Two men whose lives intersected and uh, sort of changed history, if you want to think of it that way. So the first one, his name is Henry Melville Whitney. Henry Whitney was born in 1839 in the town of Conway, Massachusetts. And if the name Whitney is familiar to you at all, there's probably a couple reasons why. What's the first one that comes to mind when I say Whitney? Eli, Eli Whitney, I heard. Yeah. So Eli Whitney, the cotton gin, uh, was a distant cousin of Henry Whitney's. Um, so he was related to that family. What else comes to mind when I say Whitney? Whitney Museum of American Modern Art in New York City, perhaps? So this Whitney family, his brother, Henry Whitney's brother William, who's also a key character in the book, married into the Vanderbilt family. Perhaps you've heard of them. <laughs> the Vanderbilt family is responsible for opening up what eventually became the Whitney Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So there is a connection to that museum as well. Henry Whitney, born in 1839. As a child, the best way to describe him is a slacker. He was lazy. He hated school, didn't study, didn't know what he wanted to do, uh, sort of could never stick with one thing, was very impatient and sort of uh, impulsive, all those things. He was very street smart, but he wasn't book smart. Um, and what he did was he sort of dropped out of school, traveled around the country chasing one invention or idea after another, but could never really figure out what he wanted to do with his life. He hooked on with his father, who was a prominent Democratic politician, who actually worked under Abraham Lincoln's administration briefly, his father ran a steamship company, and he worked on his father's steamship company for a couple of years. But again, he gained some business experience, but that was working for his father. He was riding his father's coattails, really. He didn't do anything of his own. Um, but again, one thing Henry Whitney was, was he was, like I said, street smart. And in the late 1800s, the mid to the late 1800s, there was something that was happening in Boston, which is the immigrants were flooding into the country, and a lot of them were flocking to the big cities like Boston and New York. And the city was essentially, at the time, when you think of what Boston was, it was North End, West End, Beacon Hill, Back Bay, 
that was it. That was Boston. There were Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, those farther out neighborhoods, they really didn't exist because they were too far away to get to. Only we could get there was by horse and horse carriage. That would take an hour or two hours to get there. It was really sort of a useless place. Brookline, same thing. So there were at the time, there were all these different streetcar companies pulled by horses and carriages. Henry Whitney uh, settled in Brookline when he was 40 years old. He married a woman 20 years younger than him. And again, he didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot to, uh, to his name. He was, he was a nobody other than the people of his father, who was a prominent politician, as I said. But Henry Whitney recognized what was happening. He saw all these streetcar companies in Boston. There were seven different streetcar companies. They were all operating in a different way. And he recognized that as the city was growing, as the population of Boston was growing, that these streetcar companies were eventually going to want to come out to the further suburbs, because people were going to start to move out there. They were going to need to get out there. And so what he did was, he very savvy, he started buying up some property. He bought some land and some property along what we know of now as Beacon Street in Brookline. Bought a bunch of property along Beacon Street. And sure enough, in the early 1880s, these streetcar companies at the time, they were looking to move out and to get out into Brooklyn. A lot of wealthy people were living on these estates and, and other places in Brookline. And they wanted to lay tracks right down the middle of Beacon Street. So they went to the town. And they said, we'd like to lay tracks to pull our horse-pulled carriages down the middle of Beacon Street. And the town said, well, that's wonderful. And these streetcar companies said, who owns all this land? And they said, well, you have to talk to that Mr. Whitney fellow. <laughs> so these streetcar companies went to Henry Whitney. And they said, we'd like to build tracks right up here. And he said, sure. I'll sell you back my land. <laughs> so Henry Whitney sold back a huge chunk of property that he had bought up to these streetcar companies and made a lot of money. A lot. So he sort of went from being a nobody to a somebody fairly quickly. Still not really a big businessman. He just owned some land that these streetcar companies wanted and needed. So you have to remember at this time, transportation essentially was, in the world, horse pulled carriages. That's sort of what existed in the 1870s. Uh, there was one subway system in the world. Anybody know? The world's first subway? London. 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 And I'll get back to this in a minute. But the London subway opened in 1863. 1863, the London subway opened. Another subway would not open in the world for 30 years. 30 years. When I found that out, I was fascinated. Because you would think when a technology works, that other cities would follow and would do what London did. And London subway worked, sort of. There's a big reason why I have to add the sort of there. Because in 1863, when London built underground tunnels for subway and for trains, those trains that ran underground were powered by coal. Coal, coal powered steam engines running underground. So the next time you want to complain about how dirty the green line is, just be thankful it's not powered steam engine firing black soot and smoke and sparks into the air. That's what people were riding on. People compared it to riding, uh, riding next to somebody on a train who was blowing cigar smoke in your face the entire time. It was miserable. But it worked. It moved millions of passengers, and it relieved some of the congestion from over the streets, and it relieved a lot of the sort of pain that was happening in London. But other cities looked at what London did and sort of paused and said, yeah, that's great, that's impressive, those tunnels you built, congratulations, we're going to wait for something better to come along. And so 30 years would pass before another subway, and I'll come back to that. <coughs> all right, so Henry Whitney sells all this land. These streetcar companies start to lay tracks and start to uh, lay tracks out to the suburbs and bring their uh, horse-pulled carriages out in that direction. So that's great. So now Henry Whitney has sort of become a little bit of a player. People start to know who he is. In 1888, Henry Whitney decides that he's, he's ready to make his move. He puts on his best suit. He is hard of hearing. Henry Whitney had scarlet fever when he was a boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost lost all of his hearing in one ear. So to talk, when we go to talk in public, he would often bring with him a glass of water and poke it into his ear a little bit. That would help clear his ear out so he could hear a little better. 
He went before the state legislature, I said 1888, I meant 1887, March 4th, 1887. He went before lawmakers in Beacon Hill, and he said to them, I have three proposals for you. Number one, I'm going to take all of those streetcars that are now causing a complete mess in Boston. There were seven different companies, all running different routes, charging different fares, with no regulation, no oversight. If you wanted to get on a horseback carriage, you raised your hand, and three different horseback carriages might race for you. They might knock people over to get to you, they didn't care. And once you got on, you had to sort of cross your fingers and you would get to where you wanted to go. It was just crazy, it was utter chaos. But congestion was so bad in Boston that during the work rush hours, if you want to call it that, you could essentially walk from rooftop to rooftop of streetcar on Tremont Street or on Beacon Street or on the main thoroughfares in downtown Boston without ever setting foot on the ground. Those cars were just backed up and clogged one after another after another. It was faster to walk than it was to get into a street carriage. So Henry Reedy said, I'm going to do three things for you. Number one, I'm going to take those seven different companies and I'm going to consolidate them into one company, one business, one smoothly run operation that will have consistent fares, consistent routes, designated routes. Maybe I'll use colors to designate the different routes, something that would take hold. That was number one. Number two, he said, the horse. The days of the horse are done. In 1887, there had been a new invention. I'm going to be talking about it shortly. Electricity. Electricity had come along. And also batteries were a big thing. There were other modes of transportation. In San Francisco, they were experimenting with the cable car. There were other modes of transportation that people were looking at. And the horse was seen as sort of something that had served its purpose, but maybe it was time to try something new. The horse was a majestic animal, but a lot of problems. In the summertime, they smelled. In the wintertime, they struggled, right? Ice, snow, a lot of problems. A good, solid, working horse could maybe last two years or three years. They were expensive and dangerous. A couple of reasons they were dangerous, but one of the big ones is that to maintain a stable of thousands of horses, which is what you required, meant you had to have stables in the city filled with hay. Well, as New York City learned once, all it takes is for one spark, one light, one match, something, to light a stable on fire, and it will go up like a piece of paper. And that's what happened in Europe. The entire 10 block area was destroyed by a stable fire. So horses cause problems in cities. Cities were not built to house a you know, uh, store 10,000 horses. But that's what was required. So that was his first proposal. I'm going to consolidate all your companies into one. My second, I'm going to get rid of your horses. We're going to find something new and better. And the third idea, all that congestion on Tremont Street and around Boston Common, I will build you a tunnel under Boston Common. A tunnel. No one had ever uttered those words before. A tunnel under Boston Common. The lawmakers sort of heard that and were intrigued. They listened. And they looked at Mr. Whitney and they said, you know what, sir? Those are three good ideas. Sold. You got it. <laughs> overnight, overnight, Henry Melville Whitney, this guy who I told you before, slacker, dropped out of college, a nobody, overnight, Henry Whitney became the owner of the world's largest streetcar company. Just like that. 8,000 horses, 4,000 employees, 200 miles of track, he owned all of it. Now what? <laughs> you know, these big grand promises, now he's got to come through. All right. I'm going to leave Henry Whitney for a minute. I'm going to go on to another John. In 1887, in Connecticut, a boy by the name of Frank Julian Sprague was born. Frank Sprague was the opposite of Henry Whitney. Very bright. His mother was a school teacher, brilliant young, brilliant young boy in school, uh, went off to the Naval Academy, studied in the Naval Academy. Graduated, was put onto a ship. Throughout his time in school, in the Navy, he was fascinated with engineering, constantly tinkering and drawing on his, his notepad that he kept with him wherever he went. New ideas, new inventions. He loved to tinker with his hands, was fidgeting all the time, could never sit still. 
Um, very smart. When his boat docked in London at one point, he actually went to judge a, uh, a competition. And when he was over there in London, he rode on the underground, on the tube. And while he was riding on it, on those smoke-filled trains, he thought to himself, there has to be a better thing than this. Has to be. And he sort of filed that away in his head. When he was at this uh, electronics, electric competition that he was judging in London, he met a fellow there by the name of E.E. E. Johnson. And E.E. E. Johnson started talking to this fellow, uh, Frank Sprague, who was taken by him. Sprague was in his early 20s, but he could tell he was very bright, very smart, a lot of ideas, uh, full of energy and life. Well, it turns out that E.E. E. Johnson worked for somebody back in the United States, who everybody, a fellow by the name of Thomas Edison. Oh. <laughs> and E.E. E. Johnson wrote back to Edison and said, I've met a fellow here that you need to hire. You need to hire Frank Sprague. Edison was busy. This was the early 1880s. He just invented electricity. Electricity was starting to take off. Edison sort of didn't write back to Johnson right away. He wrote him again. You need to hire Frank Sprague. Someone else is going to hire him. You have to remember, at this time, companies like Westinghouse, General Electric, these big, giant companies were all taking off. And uh, Johnson was worried that one of them was going to hire Sprague. He wanted Edison to hire him. Finally, Edison writes back and says, yes, 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 send Sprague along. I'll find something for him to do. So the opportunity, you have to understand, if you're a young engineer, the opportunity to go work for Thomas Edison, that's gold. That's, he's, he's the king. He was idolized by young engineers back then. So Edison uh, hires Sprague. Sprague gets off a boat back in New York City. There's a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, this is something I discovered in my reporting. I'll take you a little bit into the reporting of the book now. One of the tips somebody gave me when I was writing this book was to do a timeline. Create a timeline. You're writing a narrative story, which is what I was doing. You come across dates all the time. So I created the timeline, just an Excel spreadsheet. That's all it was, a basic Excel spreadsheet. Every time I came across a date, no matter what the date was, I entered it onto the spreadsheet. Date, year, and one sentence about what happened on that date. Maybe somebody was born, maybe somebody died, maybe somebody invented something, maybe somebody sold something, whatever it was. A law was passed, a bill was passed, any date. By the time I was done, the timeline had about 2,000 lines on it. A lot of dates. But what was fascinating about the process of creating the timeline was that I might be researching something over here one day, and then six months later be researching something completely unrelated over here. And I go to enter that new date into my timeline, and I discover that oh, there's something else on that date happened. So I already have an entry on that date, on that random date in history. That happened a couple times or like one day earlier or one day later, but just suddenly you start to see how history was unfolding because you see things happening at different times in different cities, and you start to see little things. So here's an example of it. On May 23rd, 1883, this is the day Frank Sprague got off his boat in New York Harbor to go get on a train and take it to Menlo Park, New Jersey to go work for Thomas Edison. So I went to enter that date on my timeline, and lo and behold, there was another date already there, another entry. Any idea what was going on getting in New York City in May of 1883? It was a big deal. Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty. No. Anyway, uh, Frank Sprague got off his boat, and there was a parade going on. Huge parade. <clears throat> People were walking toward the harbor. He didn't know what it was. He didn't care. But he just saw it. music and boats and tugboats were just tooting their horns. It was crazy. It's the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh. The same day he got off his boat. So it was a fascinating little collision of events there. So on that day, he goes down to New Jersey. He starts to hook up with Thomas Edison. When Sprague joins Thomas Edison, he wants to work on one thing. He's been thinking now for more than a year about some sort of motor. He has this idea that I need an electric motor that can power things and move things. Maybe it's small, maybe it's big, I don't know. But he wrote on that London subway ever since then, he was fascinated with the idea of using electric power 
to move and motor things, to power things. So he got ideas. He was ready to go and to work with Edison on this idea of an electric motor. Well, Thomas Edison had no interest in the motor. He was working on his own things. And so when he got Sprague to work with him, he kept giving Sprague these assignments. Go to Pennsylvania and work to light up the city of Pittsburgh. Go to this town and work on that. So Sprague was frustrated because he wanted to work on his things. And Edison had him running around working on Edison's projects. It's always one of the things you look back in history and wonder what might have happened if these two brilliant men, and they both were brilliant, if these two men had figured out a way to work together and put their minds together, what would have happened? How would history have changed? We'll never know. Because after just one year of working for Edison, Sprague wrote him a letter. And in the letter he said that I tender my resignation. I want it. And in his letter, it was interesting. He said, I want to become as famous for the electric motor as you became for the light bulb. That's how ambitious Francis Craig was. He saw the potential in this electric motor idea. But he knew, he knew that if he invented it and perfected it while he was working for Thomas Edison, who was going to get credit? <laughs> Not Frank Spray. He knew that. He had to get away from Edison. So he leaves, he leaves Thomas Edison. He goes, he takes every penny that he's got, he invests it into his own company, and he just pours his heart and soul and life into inventing the electric motor. Three years of his life. His wife never sees him. He disappears. He works and works and works. He gets closer to it and closer to it. Setbacks, problems, and this and that. He's got a little team working for him, helping him. Finally, in 1887, he thinks he's got it. He's got a motor. It's powerful. That seems to be able to move a flat car, a, street, a train car. He thinks it can work. But you know what he needs? He needs money. He needs an investor. He needs someone to believe in him and to help him take this idea from just one to many. Right? Because all he's got is a single engine. He needs to be able to mass produce it, to create it, to use it. Goes to New York City. And he connects to New York City with a fellow by the name of Jay Gould. Jay Gould is one of the richest men in the world at the time. And he's been interested in transportation and trains, and fascinated with the idea of trains. So, Frank Sprague puts his motor on the bottom of a flat car in an alleyway in 34th Street in New York City. Lays some tracks in this alley and invites Jay Gould to come to stand on this flat car with him. And he's going to show him the future. It's a big moment for Frank Sprague. He's been building during this for like five years almost. Jay Gould steps onto this flat car, and Frank Sprague pushes his little lever forward to power the motor. He gets a little over anxious, gets a little excited. And with Jay Gould standing right next to him on this flat car, Frank Sprague probably pushes his motor a little too hard. And all of a sudden, sparks shoot out from the feet of Jay Gould right next to him. He tries to jump off the, the car, even though it's going like 10 miles an hour. Frank Sprague grabs him, tells him, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, but it's too late. Jay Gould is terrified, says, this is stupid, this, this idea of electric motor is never going to happen, I'm out of here. He leaves. Ugh. Back to square one. That was his shot. And his millionaire investor ready to sign the dotted line and help him, now he lost it. Back to the drawing board. Work on the motor some more and some more. Another year. Finally, what he needs is, at this time, what's happening is cities, as I mentioned before, 1887, cities are starting to experiment. Some cities are trying batteries on the bottom of streetcars. Some cities are thinking about the cable car that San Francisco is working on. So Frank's break gets wind of something that's happening in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond is a small transit system, and they want to electrify it. They're ready to try it. Frank Spray goes down to Richmond, Virginia, and meets with them, and they say to him, OK, here's what we need. We need you to build 90 motors. You will have one year to do it. We will pay you nothing until you get the system up and running. <laughs> Would you sign that contract? No. no. But Frank Sprague was desperate. He had, this was it. He had nothing else on the table. It wasn't, he didn't have any leverage. 
He had nothing to say to them. It wasn't like he had five other cities on the table. He had Richmond and Richmond. So he did sign that contract. 90 voters, one year, get going. About a week after signing that contract, he was struck down with scarlet fever. They flattened his back for three months. His team that he had worked and got motors built and continued to work. He got healthy and eventually joined them. And in late 1887, he eventually got his motors onto the streetcars in Richmond. And Richmond, Virginia became the first city in America to have a paid electric trolley system. Wow. All powered by Frank Sprague's motors. So that was a big deal. He was on his way, kind of, to becoming Thomas Edison. But it was Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Small city in the South. Yeah. Richmond, Virginia was not going to make it famous. He needed a big city. He needed a big client. Well, what's happening in Boston in 1888? This fellow named Henry Whitney has just become the owner of the world's largest streetcar company. Right? And he's thinking about how he wants to change the system. And he's heard about something that just happened down in Richmond. But this guy who just powered the Richmond system. Henry Whitney gets in a train with a couple of his employees, takes a train down to Richmond, Virginia, meets up with Frank Sprague. And Sprague is going to show Whitney what he's accomplished. So this is a big moment in American history. July 10, 1888. It's a steamy, hot night in Richmond, Virginia. You can probably picture it. At midnight, there's a knock on Henry Whitney's door. The city is asleep. Black outside. Henry Whitney's hotel door, he's told, come outside, we have something we need to show you. He comes outside with his group, he's brought to the bottom of a very, very <laughs> steep hill in downtown Richmond. And there, Frank Sprague has lined up 21 streetcars on this steep hill, all of them at the bottom of the hill. He's lined them all up. And he's told his crew, working in the power station, about half a mile away, to give Every, every ounce of energy that he's got in that power station, he's going to need it tonight. Mm -hmm. So, Frank Sprague waves a lantern in the air. And those 21 motors all power up. And they slowly start to climb that hill, all 21 cars. I always wonder what would have happened if they didn't get up that hill. <laughs> what if they stopped to start rolling backwards, just stopped halfway up and didn't make it? But that didn't happen. All 21 engines got up the hill, crested the hill, and disappeared. And in that moment, Henry Whitney had seen the future. The future was the electric motor. Frank Sprague came up to Boston and agreed to start building engines for Henry Whitney in Boston. And by, the round, by around 1890, Boston was essentially done with a horse. Its entire system had been electrified. So he accomplished one of his goals, right? He was going to, he accomplished two of his goals. He had consolidated those seven companies into one, which he called the West End Street Railway Company, and he now had electrified the trolley system. So what about that third goal, the tunnel? So Henry Whitney, as I said before, he was one thing, he was impatient. He could never stick around to see something through to the end. In 1891, sort of out of nowhere, he quit. Walked away from the West End Street Railway Company. Just resigned. Moved on to go invest in a coal company in Canada and Rhode Island and all these crazy places. And a sad sort of uh, end to Henry Whitney's life. He died in 1923 with $1,000 to his name. Oh, yeah. None. He lost it all in all these different investments because he could never stop sort of pursuing the next big thing. So, 1891, new leadership takes over the West Street Railway Company. 1894, <laughs> voters in Boston go to the polls. New mayor in town, Nathan Matthews, he supports the idea of a subway, of a tunnel that Henry Whitney had first proposed. Voters in Boston go to the polls to vote on whether they should build a subway. They vote. The final vote was about 15,200 to 14,800 mm -hmm. in favor of a subway. Pretty close, actually. A lot of merchants were very opposed to it. They were concerned that the construction was going to destroy their business. No one saw, no one could really look down the road and think about how important this was. They were very much in the here and now, and it was very nimby. Not in my backyard. There was a lot of that going on. So, 
1895, March of 1895, they broke ground on the first subway in America. Funny story about the breaking ground. Think about all the groundbreakings that we see today. There's a building, a bridge, a, sky, a skyscraper. Every time there's a huge groundbreaking, what happens? Who shows up? Mayor. Mayor. Everybody. The mayor, the governor, nine different construction people. They all get gold shovels and hard hats, and they all get to put a shovel in the ground and claim a little piece of history. And I was involved in this. I was, this was important to me. In March of 1895, when Boston went to break ground on the first subway in America, can't emphasize that enough, first subway in America, three guys with a shovel went out to Boston Common. And they were literally like, should we call the mayor? <laughs> they called the mayor's office and said, does the mayor want to come out? We're about to put a shovel in the ground for their first subway. But now the mayor's busy. He's over an event in South Boston, don't worry about it. That was how ground was broken for the first subway in America. It was not a big deal. Um, the first subway leg took about two and a half years to build. It went from the corner of Arlington Street and uh, Arlington and Boylston, where the big church is. It went underground there, and it went to the corner of Boylston and um, Tremont Street, where the movie theater is now, essentially. Turned left, it went to the Park Street Church, and then just turned around and came back. It was like 1.8 miles of track, roughly, altogether. That was the first leg of the Boston subway. It took about two and a half years to build, came in under budget. It was supposed to cost $5 million, came in at $4.2 million. Just like a big dip. Just like <laughs> 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 Sorry, goodness. <laughs> that joke never fails. Um, so it came in at $4.2 million under the $5 million budget. Um, the first day of the subway, then I'm going to stop and take your questions, was September 1st, 1897. That was the first day of the Boston subway and the first subway in America. And I will read you one page from the book, which describes what that day and what that uh, sort of moment was like for the first subway in America. It was sort of an exciting day, an exciting moment. What's that? <laughs> I have so many pages folded over. This is, you can tell, this book has been to a lot of readings over the years. It's taken a beating, but it keeps on tipping. Um, okay. Um, all right, here it is. So, the train, the subway car, I should say, it was car number 1752. Um, it had seats for 45 passengers. And when it pulled to the top of that hill at the corner of Arlington Street, it had 140 passengers on it. So it was just, people were literally hanging off of the side of the car. It was such a historic moment. The clock in the Arlington Street Church pointed at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning, crept to the summit of the subway tunnel's downward slope. If ever there was a time to stop and acknowledge the moment, this was it. Perhaps a speech from Mayor Quincy was in order or from ex-mayor Nathan Matthews, or Henry Whitney, or Governor Wolcott, or the chief engineer Henry Carson, anybody who had a hand in bringing America's first subway, an electric subway, to this day. Not only was it completed on time in two and a half years, it came in at $4.2 million, under the $5 million budget. There had been 10 people killed in a gas explosion, and four others died in the building of the subway. But it was constructed without as much disruption to the streets as had been anticipated. Municipal governments at the time were notorious for being small-minded, underachieving bureaucracies, too easily intimidated by business interests and susceptible to corruption. Boston had defied all of those labels and even managed to preserve the one piece of land that was cherished the most, Boston Common. And I didn't talk about this, but I'll mention it here. When they started digging the subway, they discovered that the route was going right through two graveyards. 
And they had to move 900 bodies, 900 graves, I should say. The uncovering of 910 bodies in the path of the suburb was an unfortunate finding. But Dr. Green's delicate handling of it had mitigated the public's worries. The suburb was a success by every measure before it even opened. And the small flags waved amid the deafening cheers, the crowd almost seemed to be clamoring for someone to recognize the achievement. It had been 10 years since two men, Henry Whitney in Boston and Abram Hewitt in New York, first made serious overtures about tunneling beneath their cities. A decade later, one of those cities stood at the brink of history, while the other had yet to put a shovel into the ground. For Boston, that was satisfaction enough. By now, Jimmy Reed's car was so crowded it seemed in danger of tipping over and it was difficult to imagine the electric motor having enough power to move it. He pulled on his strap, signaling he was ready, clanged his gong, and switched on the electric current. An Austin car number 1752 eased forward, crested the hill, dipped down the incline, and disappeared beneath boilers. <coughs> the passengers in the front seats all stood up on their tiptoes and leaned forward, peering ahead to see what sights awaited them. And from the rear, a shout rang out, Down in front! <laughs> so, I'll stop there. I'll tell one little anecdote, a personal story, and then I'll take any question you want to talk about. So, uh, about halfway through writing this book, um, I was lucky enough, writing the book was a process for me. Essentially, I was working my full-time job. I would write one day a weekend, so I sort of just dedicated either Saturday or Sunday to writing and working on it. Usually, I tried to pick the day that was less nice. <laughs> um, when you have two little kids, which I did at the time, they're not so little anymore, but they were then, um, that's hard. Um, you know, my son, Ben, would sometimes come in, he was probably five. Um, he would come in to my study while I was working, and, Dad, can you come out and play? Um, and it was hard. I had a deadline, I had to write. I had no choice. So, it was difficult. But we were able to get away for a weekend in New York City. Um, in the summer, while I was in the book. Went to New York, I used to live in the city, um, and we stayed in the Upper West Side, for those of you who know New York, and we uh, went down to ride the subway, went down to the 79th Street Station, which is where I live. Um, and there was a moment when we were waiting for the number one train to come and to whisk us downtown, and my kids, like I said, they were maybe five and seven-ish or so, they would run up to the yellow line sort of peer down the tracks to see where the train was coming, then run back and run up and run back, just be kids. So you have to remember, for a kid, riding on a subway is like an amusement park. I mean, it's their <laughs> roller coaster. It's yeah. exciting. This was their, probably their first real memorable time in New York City where they were going to remember this. So one of those moments when they ran up to the uh, yellow line, I took my phone out and I snapped a picture of it. And I still have that picture on our wall at home. It's just a picture of these two wide-eyed kids staring down the tracks waiting for the train. And the reason I love that picture is, in addition to it being very personal for me, is it makes me think about what it must have been like for passengers in Boston on September 1st, 1897, and in New York City on October 27, 1904, when they were riding on the subway for the very first time. Imagine what that must have been like. You're underground. Yeah. Only time you went underground was if you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people thought. They were terrified of the underground. It was a scary place. Yeah. And now they were going underground to get onto a train, to whisk them through a dark tunnel. They were going to come out in a different place. The whole concept was so bizarre and foreign to people. But they did it. And that anticipation and the excitement and the nervousness and all those emotions I felt like they were sort of jumbled up into one, and that's what I sort of see in my kids when I look at that picture, that same sort of excitement. And so it just made me think about what it must have been like for those people riding on that very first summer. So, I will stop there. And then... Any questions or things I didn't touch on? I talked about Boston more than New York, obviously. New York is a whole half of the book. Um, but uh, I just wanted to focus on Boston, since that's where we are. Yeah? I was wondering about the third rail that they put in there and that they still have. Did they talk about how um, uh, the supply of electricity? I still think that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah, the third rail, I mean, it is. Back then, it was, um, electricity was so, such a new thing. It was very scary. One of the things that often happened on the the tracks were electrified above ground before they were put underground. And 
horses, for example, were terrified of the tracks. Um, they would sort of see those tracks, and they knew that they were dangerous, and there was reasons to avoid them. So the third rail was and remained sort of a scary thing for people. That's where the electricity is coming from. Um, but like with everything, they figured out solutions to it, and they moved it to the side. It sort of is not the tracks are sort of separate from the third rail. So, but it's always that's how you get the electricity. That's where it comes from. So it was always a thing, but it was never uh, an obstacle. It was part of the construction. Yep. What was the tie between the linkage between Frank Sprague and Sprague Electric? So it essentially became his company eventually became Sprague Electric. He has family lives out in the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. uh, a son named Steven Sprague actually supplied some of the photos I used in the book. Um, so, I, I'm not a son, I should say a grandson. Um, so, yeah, Sprague Electric is, its roots go back to Frank Sprague. Yep. Does he play any part in the subway, Sprague? It's an interesting part of the story. The documentary that was made um, uh, on PBS, the American Experience documentary, gets into that a little more than I did in the book. Sadly, what happened is, after Sprague sort of had his success, he was bought out by GE. Oh. And GE replaced all the Sprague labels with GE. Oh. So he sort of lost his name, which is one of the reasons why you don't really know his name. No. I make an argument at the end of the book that I put Frank Sprague right there alongside Henry Ford, the yeah. Wright brothers, mm -hmm. and sort of all these big names that we think of in Edison, that we think of the, how they contributed to society with their giant inventions. I put him right in there. The sad part is that he sort of never got the recognition he deserved. Yeah. So how did Whitney, did he have to buy the seven original companies? Yeah, he was a pretty shrewd businessman. He sort of went to each of the companies and got some of their key members to join him, sort of negotiated with them. The ones who were willing to come on and work for him did. The ones who did not want to work for him left. So, but he had, fortunately, the blessing of the lawmakers to do it. That helped him sort of negotiate and get what he needed. So that's how he was able to sort of, you know, pull it off. Because a lot of people wanted and said, well, wait a minute. Essentially, they just gave him permission to create a monopoly, which is what he did. But, um, so they were so desperate. It was essentially a private company. It was a private company, yeah. The West Central Brooklyn Bridge was a private company. Correct. The West Central Railway Company was a private company. Yep. And in a subway pattern, was that private too? Yes, at first it was. At first it was a private operation, and then eventually it changed and became sort of like, it's not unlike what it is now, where private companies own the tracks and lease it from the state or from the city. Mm -hmm. Did they originally use a catenary system? To what system? A catenary, you know, the overhead. Like this trolley stuff. Right. They, so, so another of Frank's. I know someone mentioned that, but I think yeah. originally. So another of Frank Sprague's inventions was the the, uh, the electric pole, the telephone pole. That was another of his inventions. Um, so at first, they did use overhead wires, and eventually they made them underground. But they did use overhead wires at first. Yep. Why? Uh, I'm sorry. Did we. Again, him first, him first and then you next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, why did Boston choose to go both ways with both the elevated and the tunnel. Why didn't they all do the tunnel? Why, why didn't they build the elevated? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So they didn't build an elevated. Uh, I mean, well, later an elevated came with like the orange line, but, right. but early um, elevated trains were tricky because they really worked. If you think about why New York City embraced the elevated train, it worked on really long avenues. We could just run a train all the way down Broadway, you know, for miles and miles. That was okay. Boston didn't have that. Boston had lots of small, narrow streets with lots of turns. Building an elevated train made no sense for Boston. So that was sort of one of the reasons why they just never seriously considered building it out. And that was the same reason why Boston never really pursued the cable car. The cable car worked in San Francisco. And New York City actually pursued the cable car for a little while. Because it works when you have a lot of long, straight streets. That's where the cable is effective. As soon as you have to start winding that cable around lots of turns, it loses its effectiveness. And so Boston never pursued the cable car. They did. Yeah. 
one, um, the book is so exciting. So this is like the first part of hearing a great story about the book, but you'll enjoy, I can tell you, you'll enjoy every page, every story of every character is extremely well researched. Um, Doug, I just wanted to mention the two brothers, the yeah. Whitney brothers. Could you just touch a little bit on the fact that they weren't, I think my understanding, they're not competing with each other, right. but William Whitney, who goes to New York, so right. two brothers from Massachusetts, one stays in Boston, the other goes to New York, he's a lawyer, he's rather successful, William Whitney, that's yep. where the museum is what the name will come from. Yeah. Can you just touch on the time period, that, because we put our sub our underground in. Yeah. So the New York, right. And then New York sure. Is so the New York subway years. opens in 1904. So seven years after the Boston subway is when the New York subway opens. New York should have beaten Boston by every reason. They were ahead of them, Boston in thinking. They were ahead of Boston in ambition. They wanted to do it, and they just could not get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. Politics, dirty politics, Boss Tweed. There were a lot of big things that got in the way of New York building its subway. <laughs> William Whitney, um, Henry's brother, by younger brother by about two years, um, was a very big, ambitious person. He, in 1896, if William Whitney had wanted to run for president of the United States, he probably would have been elected. He was that powerful. People were wearing Whitney for president buttons at the Chicago Convention. Um, instead, he was secretary of the Navy under uh, Grover Cleveland. And he had a huge role in rebuilding the United States Navy. Um, William Whitney got involved when he moved back to New York City in the street transit operations of New York, just like his brother did in Boston. And he played a big role in the late 1880s and the early 1890s in sort of New York embracing the idea of a subway, embracing the idea of electric transit, and sort of doing that. He played sort of an interesting role, which I'm sure to get into, but he played a critical but tiny role in why New York City finally was able to uh, get the summer bill passed. Um, it involved politics and a little dirty politics and some other things. But he was a fascinating guy who really could have been one of the great you know, figures in American political history. But he always enjoyed working more behind the scenes than he did wanting the, the limelight. Mm -hmm. A lot like our current president. <laughs> I was teasing. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was teasing. Yes. Yeah. Um, Did you happen to have an option between AC and DC part of this picture? Yes. I always get this question, and this is where I have to start by saying I'm not an engineer. Um, so AC and DC was a big part of the picture. Sprague worked in, uh, in DC. And so that's how this thing started. But if you ask me anything more than that, I'm going to go to the next person. <laughs> I just I I didn't get into the specifics of the engineering and electricity because I just I was worried that it goes down a rabbit hole that I would never escape from. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you doing now? At the Globe? Yeah. So I worked at the Globe. Uh, I was for about a decade. Uh, an editor in the newsroom. I was the editor of the Sunday Magazine for about six years. Uh, I sort of did a, I was hired to essentially tear up the Sunday Magazine and redesign it in like 2004, which is the big thing I started to do. Um, and then I became the deputy managing editor for features. So I oversaw arts, travel, real estate, uh, and the magazine, sort of a bigger managerial role. Um, and then about two years ago, roughly, um, I was asked by the then CEO of our company to move over to the business side and to help us, as you know, newspapers are struggling <coughs> these days. Um, I was asked to move over to the business side to help us try to come up with new ideas for creating new revenue streams, new, just creative ideas. So for the last couple of years, I've been working on the business side with the advertising department and with the newsroom to a certain degree, trying to think of new ways that we can drive revenue <coughs> and create new revenue streams for us so that we can continue to put out very important product. Yeah. So, anyway, so that's what I'm going to have. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, you said in the book there's a lot about the ethnic makeup of the, uh, the people who are working in the subway and the, uh, maybe even the flesh box free connection? Yeah, I mean, so the people, the workers who built the subway were largely immigrants. Yeah. Irish, Italian immigrants, 
Um, and they were the ones who really did the, the grunt work uh, on sort of digging the tunnel. You have to remember back then, digging a tunnel meant literally digging a tunnel. They went out there with picks and axes and shovels, and they had some sort of cranes that could scoop out some dirt, but then they would just scoop it into a carriage that was pulled by a horse, and the horse would wheel out the dirt. So it was a slow, tedious process. Um, it was, to a certain degree, dangerous, um, again, just because of the working conditions. I mentioned that there was, uh, in March of uh, 1897, six months before the subway opened, there was a gas leak, and there was a huge explosion, and 10 people were killed. Um, that was by far the deadliest accident that happened. Um, but yeah, it was mostly sort of Irish and Italian immigrants who really built the subway and, and did a lot of that work. And I do talk about that in the uh, book. I get into sort of the back. A lot of them from Jamaica Plain. The lead contractor on the project was from JP, and he hired a lot of workers from JP. He sort of wanted to do that. Any old abandoned tunnels? There are. If you ride the Green Line now, there are certain points where the tunnel will take a turn, and if you look to the left or to the right, you can actually see some of the original tunnels that are still there. Um, there are a few people who can sometimes get you down into those tunnels and get a little tour. You can get a little look at the tour. Down at Square. Yeah, there's one time. They found right. They found like an old Scully Square sign down there. Yeah. yeah. So, so the original tunnels are still down there for a lot of them. Take two more, maybe? Yeah. Can you tell us any stories about either Mr. Henry or his bride? <laughs> John Henry and Linda Henry? Uh, I was just in a meeting with Linda Henry today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Don't worry. Uh, are there any great stories? I mean, what I can tell you is that, you know, Linda um, is a fascinating woman who is deeply passionate about the globe and about um, trying to figure out a way to make this work. She is at the office every day. Uh, she's often there before I even get there. Um, she is involved in a lot of different things. Um, and she's just sort of, one of the things that Linda is known for, and it's a funny word, but, um, but I think it's true, is she really believes in the idea of convening. What I mean by that is convening audiences, bringing people together to talk about things. And if it's an event, if it's a globe event or something else, she's a big believer in just convening discussion, having the globe be the convener, the globe drive discussion. And so that series that happened last year about race um, was a big series. And after that series happened, we held a series of events around the city that a lot of people came to driving a discussion about race in Boston and Boston's sort of ugly history with sort of race relations. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that I think Linda's very passionate about, where the globe is at the center of a discussion and bringing people together for a common good. Um, John is less visible, you know, he's got lots of things he's working on. He's got a soccer team in London, he's got the Red Sox, he's got a racing team, uh, and the globe is one of his properties that he's very passionate about. So he's, he's got his hands in a lot of different things, so we don't see him as much. Um, so. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned revenue streams. Yeah, are the obituaries a huge revenue stream? Surprisingly, yes. They still are. I mean, it's changed. It's not what it used to be, but they still are. It's one of those things that, you know, when someone passes away, uh, a loved one wants people to remember that person. And, and they pay. They pay. They pay. I mean, if you want to put something into the newspaper that we're not doing, it's essentially, you know, it's a form of advertising if you want to think of it. But obviously you're not advertising, but it's a form of, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a product that we offer. And so, yeah, it does still make um, revenue for the globe. It's important. I mean, it's a cliche, but what's the first thing a lot of people turn to in the newspaper? <laughs> you do. What's the old joke some comedian said? I wait for everyone to see if I'm still here. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? George Burns. All right, one more question. Yes, I didn't talk about that today, but in 1888, there's a whole chapter in the book devoted to it. The Blizzard of 1888 was a pivotal moment.
for all cities because it buried the entire East Coast in snow like we've never seen and it caused every city, Boston, New York, and elsewhere, to sort of take a look at their transit systems and say, we can't allow this to happen again where we get crippled by snow. Because they was, we were crippled. And so that was a real big moment when we started to move systems on the ground. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for your questions. I did bring books. If anyone wants a copy, I have some. Um, unfortunately, I don't have singles. So if you want to pay for it, I can take a credit card um, on my phone with an app. Um, it's $17, but I don't have any singles. So that's my fault. I, just, I can't trade for work and have time to get singles. So best I can do. But, but if you want to pay with credit card, I'm happy to do that. So, thank you very much. Thank you for coming.